on today's faith-inspiring edition of Fixing the Money Thing. Today's topic, I call it the shift, meaning that you can't keep staring at your problems and expect to win. You have to shift your attention, your perspective to what God says. You may think in a situation that is standing against you that you have to engage and fight it uh, by yourself. That is not true. Are you ready to shift your way of thinking about God and His kingdom? So if you find yourself in fear, you need to shift your attention from the problem to how awesome God is. This is a powerful truth that you need to understand. Gary Cassie and his message, The Shift, transforming fear to faith on today's edition of Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a financial, chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, you're living like many of my people are, living in debt. He said, I want my people free. Your financial freedom is closer than you think. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. Financial problems, they're slow death. We're trying to change the way you think about money. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. We got a lot to cover today, and I have a question to ask. First off, how many have spent some time in the book of, let's see here, what's a good topic here? Chronicles. (laughs) Anyone read Chronicles this week? Over here, there's one. Two, is that it? Okay. It is in the Bible. (laughs) Uh, You know, it parallels Kings. It talks about uh, the old uh, Kings and different things. We're going to talk about Kings today. How many have heard of Jehoshaphat? Yes? Really? That's the lowest amount of cheers I've heard of the last two services. Really, you've heard of Jehoshaphat? Okay, thank you. And what kingdom did he rule? Judah. Judah. And of course, if you're new here, Israel was 10 tribes in the north and two in the south. And for you, like trivia type stuff, who was the king of the northern kingdom at that same time? Ahab Ahab and his beautiful wife, Jezebel. Jezebel. That's right. We're going to talk about them today, so grab your Bible. We'll be right here in chapter 20 in a second. But I'm going to talk about Jehoshaphat for a minute. Jehoshaphat was a righteous king uh, in Judah. He did a lot to bring the nation of Judah back into conformity with the law in his earlier days when he launched out at first. But he became very wealthy, and he began to compromise Uh, One of the biggest compromises he made was allowing, or not saying allowing, they did it on purpose. His son married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. Uh, they, They wanted to come together into agreement, maybe for protection, but that was a bad move. Ahab is not a good guy. Jezebel's definitely not a good influence, right? And so it came to pass that Ahab wanted to launch a battle against another kingdom, and he asked Jehoshaphat to join him. God said, do not help Ahab in this battle, but you can guess what he did. He helped. And after he got back from the battle, by the way, Ahab was killed in that battle. So after Jehoshaphat got back from the battle, he was confronted by a prophet who confronted him and said, you know, why are you helping the, the, the evil people? Basically, here's the actual quote. He says to Josephat, the wrath of God is all upon you. The wrath of God. So God is not happy with Josephat. But the prophet said, because you were righteous in your earlier days and did so much for the kingdom of Judah, you know, God is not going to destroy you or whatever. Uh, but he repented and began to seek the Lord And then he found out that something else was going on. A very large, huge army was on their way to wipe out the nation of Judah. We'll pick the story up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 2. 
Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you. They're already almost here. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat re- resolved to inquire of the Lord and to proclaim a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. They came from every part of the nation. Then Jehoshaphat stood up at the temple and led a prayer for this situation. I'm not going to read the prayer, but it's quite lengthy. At the end of it, though, it kind of gives you the inside view of what is actually happening. Jehoshaphat says, for we have no power to face this vast army. Now, he's not talking about we have no power with God's help. He means in the natural, there is no way we're going to be able to defend ourselves against this huge army. Then he goes on and says, we do not know what to do but our eyes are on you, on the Lord. So if you're facing anything huge today, something bigger than you, you can't see a way out, this is your day, thank you that you're here. Because today you're gonna learn, today's topic, I call it the shift. Meaning that you can't keep staring at your problems and expect to win. You have to shift your attention, your perspective to what God says. And Jehoshaphat says, our eyes are on you. He learned his lesson. My eyes are on you, Lord. That is your confession. What does God say about this situation? And we're going to learn what happened here. Now, after the prayer, a prophet of God was there and began to prophesy to the nation. And we'll pick that up right here, verse number 15. This prophet says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Underline, do something to mark that in your Bible. Tomorrow, march down against them. Stop everything. I thought they're outnumbered. God's saying to march against them? Well, let's finish the story. They will be climbing up at the passes, and you'll find them at the end of the gorge, the desert trail. So he's telling them where they're at. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Now, that sounds almost identical to Ephesians chapter 6 that says, put on the whole armor of God, and when you've done everything to stand, stand. And to stand on what? Is he talking about the dirt? You know, stand on the dirt? No, he's talking about stand on what God says. In fact, if you examine every piece of the spiritual armor Paul teaches in Ephesians 6, all of them are around the word of God. Every one of them is the word of God. So put that on everywhere and stand on what God says. Now, this is important because you may think in a situation that is standing against you that you have to engage and fight it uh, by yourself. That is not true. How many have kids here? If your kid has a problem, your child has a problem, how many parent would agree that's my problem? If your child's in trouble, how many agree you're, you know, your child, that's, that's your problem? Now, God is no different. You are his people. And so it says this in Philippians, be anxious for Nothing. how much? Nothing. Well, then what's going to happen? Be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and petition, let your request be known to God with thanksgiving, and then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Guard from what? Fear. Whose battle is it? It's God's. Give it to God. He has the answer. It's the same thing he told them. Give it to God. God is your answer. He is, it's his battle. He will, he will take care of it. You have to walk it out, but he'll take care of it. Something happens here. This series, The Shift, is the power of praise and worship. How many know when you're in trouble, you don't really feel like praising? <laughs> the devil doesn't want you to praise, that's for sure. We're going to look at that today, though. So here's what happened. This prophet says, you don't have to bat, this isn't your battle. 18, this is, this is the so awesome scripture in this whole story. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat 
when the prophet said, it's, it's over, God's taking care of it, he bowed with his face to the ground. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Let me kind of make this clear to you. There was no hope. No hope. The nation would be lost. The temple destroyed. God's people destroyed. There's no hope. And then God says, stand still. You'll not have to fight this battle. It's my battle. The response was an immediate worship of God. When you have a revelation of how big God is, and it's by revelation. People think worship is something that you do, like it's, you know, we we have praise and worship. It's time to worship. That is not true. Worship comes out of your heart. It is not an action. It's a response. It is a response of the revelation of God. When you understand and see him for who he is, what he does, what he's done, and you realize what you realize, there is nothing else to do but worship. It's like, whoa. They just fell down like, whew. Have you ever been in a worship service or a church service where, you know, it gets down the road and people, you kind of step into that flow and it gets quiet? You know, there was singing and dancing and now it's just like this silent presence of God. That's worship. It's a heartfelt response to God. It's not something that you do out of duty. It's not something you plan on doing out of rote memory. It is a response to who he is. And so here they're facing this huge problem, and God says, I'll take care of it. Whoa. I remember in a human sense, back when we were first married, I didn't, uh, really, I didn't know much back then. But anyway, I, I, I didn't. I I didn't keep up with my taxes for a couple years, and I ended up finally filing taxes after a couple years of not filing, and you owe $5,000. Back then, 43 years ago, whatever it was, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, right? And I didn't have that money at all. I didn't have a chance, really, of having that money. And I had gone on a trip. uh, We went to see my parents here in Ohio. We were in Tulsa at the time. And, um, you know, we were talking about business and stuff. And I mentioned to my dad, well, my dad, you know, he disappears and he comes back with a check for $5,000. Unexpected. And my dad, if you remember the stories, my dad's not a believer, but he was generous. He, was a, he, had, he had kind of a streak of generosity. And at that moment, I felt helpless in the sense that I had no answer for that. When my dad walked up and paid that, my immediate response was just to grab him and hug him and just... Thank him. Thanksgiving. It wasn't something like, okay, it's time to thank your dad. You understand what I'm saying? It's, hey, it's time to thank your dad. You know, no, see, no, that's not it. It was an immediate response of hugging this guy. It's like, just, you know, like saying, you're awesome. You're awesome. You know, just, it's, it's a grateful response. And that's what worship really is. Now let's go on in the story here. So then after they bowed down and worshiped, the Levites began to sing with a loud voice. But what are they singing? Are they worshiping? No, it says they praised the Lord. We need to understand the difference of praise and worship. So they praised the Lord, it says, and uh, with a very loud voice. Then Joseph, at verse 21, spoke to the people. Then he, after he spoke to the people, he appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him, not worship, praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. So he put these guys that were singing out in front of the army. Now remember, they're not going to enter this battle. God already told them to stand. But he puts these people to sing praises out in front. And here's what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And here's the, here's the difference of praise. Praise is a response of what God does. So they're praise thanking God for, fill the blank in. Okay, praise, worship is who he, oh, oh, you're, oh, it's a, oh my goodness. Praise is praising God for what he does or what he's done. And so they're thanking him. Now as they began to sing and praise 
God then set ambushes for the army and they defeated this innumerable army, which is a very key aspect that you need to understand. You want to get God involved with whatever you're involved with, praise and worship. Now, here's, why, here's how it happens, though. Praise declares God's doings, what he does, what he's done. Praise declares and mainly declares it to you. So we start our service with praise and offering because praises declares if you're sick, you're singing God heals. If you have a need, you are declaring and singing that God meets needs. See, praise lifts him up, as we heard in the song. It lifts him up in your eyes. It sets him in a place of honor in your eyes. Then next, your response is worship. Praise sets him up as your answer. You're reviewing. You're talking about who he is to you, and you're praising him for what he's done, and then you worship. So there's a difference. So he started out praising because it builds God up in our, our mind. Now, worship, most people think worship is time for the slow songs and, uh, you know, the more quieted atmosphere. And praise is kind of more lively. Praise is only more lively because it's celebratory. You're celebrating God. You're celebrating what he does. You're celebrating what he's done. You're celebrating him. But worship is not a slow song. As I said, worship comes out of the heart. But let me add something to this. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, verse number one, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, what's the next word? What is it? Say it again. Spiritual act of worship. Some versions say reasonable act of worship, or some say true and proper worship. Spiritual. Let me paraphrase. The greatest act of worship is obedience. Worship is obedience. Let me, let me give you a definition to help you here. The definition in the dictionary of worship is this. To regard with great or extravagant respect. Extravagant respect, extravagant honor, and extravagant devotion. Now, if you have extravagant respect and honor and devotion, there's going to be obedience that honors and follows that, correct? Your greatest act of worship is obedience. If you don't obey, it tells me you don't honor, you're not devoted, right? And certainly the Bible says, I mean, dictionary says extravagant respect, extravagant honor and devotion, so to paraphrase, it'd be like, whatever you need, God, whatever I can do, whatever, you know, to honor you, whatever. You follow this, I mean, it's extravagant. Extravagant devotion, honor, respect is worship. So God uh, says here in Romans chapter 12, Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy, now, the entire book of Romans is talking about the plan of salvation and how you have been delivered into the kingdom of God. And so in view of God's mercy towards you in his plan to bring you out of darkness into light, in view of that, what should your response be? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. What does that mean? It means do what he says. Offer yourselves in extreme devotion and respect and honor. God, whatever you need, I'm here. Whatever it is. I honor you. I respect you. You have, through your mercy, changed my life, set my path on a different path. You have given me life from death. I mean, whatever it is. Like, you know, we worship, but whatever it is, whoa, whatever, just tell me. You need money? Tell me. Whatever you need. Hey, I got it. Just let me, let me be involved. I want to I lay my life down as a sacrifice. In, uh, this, is my, this is my spiritual act of worship. It's not a slow song. It's not goosebumps. It's obedience. You want to make God happy? Obey. Now, we all enjoy the anointing. But you want to, you want to experience some great anointing? Be in obedience. Obedience is the highest form of worship.
Worship is a stance, a holy reverence, an extravagant reverence of God. Now, I don't stop to worship. Like, okay, now it's time, to, you know, it's our worship service, time to worship. No, no. I mean, we do that. We, we come into praise and worship, and, the, of course, God inhabits the praises of his people, the Bible says. But we don't turn a switch on and say, I'm going to worship because my life is worship. You understand? My life is worship. I don't choose to, okay, it's time to worship. Because you can act like you're worshiping, but if your heart is not involved, you're not worshiping. See, your heart is a response to who God is. You know, I pray that Paul said to Ephesians first chapter, I pray that your eyes would be opened to this glorious inheritance that you have and who you are in Christ and the power that brought Jesus out of the grave. And he says that your eyes, revelation. I wonder how many people have the revelation of what they're saying. It's like, oh my goodness, if you had the revelation of what you're speaking with your mouth, who he is, oh my goodness. It's like, whoa. Right? They're, oh my goodness. Every dominion, you know, there's no name high. I mean, oh my goodness, you know. How did I get here? How did I get this body? How am I living? You know, I didn't come here on my own. I show up here on the earth. I got a body. Look how it works. I mean, look at creation. I mean, God, you're amazing. I mean, how, how could this happen? You're worthy of my devotion, my respect, my honor. There is no one like you. I mean, I mean, it's just, you just poof, right? Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Now, here we understand. Worship means to serve the Lord with gladness. Worship, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. Here's, here's why we can worship. We, he made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, which tells us he's going to take care of us. He's going to lead us to green pastures, still waters. He is responsible for us. He's got this. We worship him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. See, praise always has a reason. Praise says, for the Lord is good. We praise him because his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations to me. So praise declares, declares what God does. Worship responds to who he is. Making a difference? All right. When you praise God, you cannot stay in fear very long. Your attention has been changed from the problem. You are declaring the answer. Meaning that if you are sick and you are praising God that he heals, or if you have a need and you're praising God, he is faithful and loyal to his word that he provides everything. See, as you're declaring, praise declares, reminds you, lifts him high above the problem, you cannot stay in fear and praise at the same time. So if you find yourself in fear, you need to shift your attention from the problem to how awesome God is. Just stop and begin to praise him for the past victories he gave you. Yeah. Begin to praise him for what his word says about you, what his promises say. And as you do so, there's going to be a shift of your attention from the problem to the answer. And you're going to walk out feeling invigorated and hopeful. Join us next time on Fixing the Money Thing. 